And is there a ledger pointer? Yes, she has to go find that. Great. Okay. Testing one, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay. So Doug uh, has done his PhD in Berkeley, and then he was he was a postdoctoral fellow in Princeton, and after that he joined uh, Harvard as a faculty, and he has been a faculty since then, and he has various research interests, uh, all of which I cannot list now, but today <laughs> he's going to talk us about update on the Fermi bubble. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, there are uh, kind of two things I wanted to mention um, that are both related to gamma rays in the inner galaxy. And um, I'm going to put this on the other side since I seem to systematically face that way. So uh, something about the Fermi bubbles and something about the so-called inner galaxy GEV excess, just a, a few slides on each. Um, so the most interesting thing, in my opinion, to happen on the Fermi bubbles in the last year was this paper by Andrew Fox et al. This is uh, the idea is to use UV absorption lines to get a velocity of the expansion of the Fermi bubbles. And um, so I don't really need to remind most of you, but the uh, Fermi bubbles are this structure, these giant lobes coming out of the center of the galaxy. Now by giant, I mean 30 times smaller than the previous speakers, giant lobes, but I think that the Milky Way should not succumb to lobe envy. So uh, these are big enough, about eight kiloparsecs high. And uh, what Fox et al. did is point at this quasar through the bubbles and get UV absorption lines um, for a number of different states. And so here's some of the data, so silicon-3, carbon-2, carbon-4, and so on. And in many of these, most of these, you can see uh, an absorption dip here, 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 here. Uh, so this one's, you know, kind of at rest. Sorry, I guess I cut off the axis where these are actually labeled. So this is at rest. This is coming towards us at some speed of uh, a few hundred kilometers per second and receding at a few hundred. And uh, so what do those four velocities correspond to? So they have a, a model of how these structures might be expanding. And uh, remember, this is, this is pretty agnostic about what's actually expanding, just that there's a layer of ionized material on the edge uh, is, is all they really need. Um, I mean, there are different models about, you know, maybe there's a forward shock and a contact discontinuity and a reverse shock. And, you know, this structure can be somewhat complicated. But um, what they're probably uh, doing is, so in their model, they have the galaxy rotating. This is looking down from the top. This is looking from the side. Um, this is the radial velocity you would see in different parts of this looking down from the top and the side. And so this asymmetry here is because they've put in the rotation of the galaxy in addition to the expansion. And uh, so they claim that they're seeing a component coming towards us, a component kind of at rest from other material, a receding component, and then there's kind of a fourth component that you know, is maybe open to some interpretation. Um, but anyway, if you're interested in the details, I invite you to read their paper. Their bottom line was after deprojecting all of this, they got a velocity of about 900 kilometers per second for the expansion. And that's great because for the last five years, a lot of people have wanted to know how old are the Fermi bubbles? How fast are they expanding? How much energy is contained? And these are all kind of the same question, right? Um, so uh, two and a half to four mega years seems to be the answer. So our 2010 paper was exactly right because we said one to 10 mega years. And, Physicists consider, you know, from the Planck time to the Hubble time, that's about 50 decades, and we chose the right decade. And the way we did that was uh, incredibly simple. If you want it to be younger than a mega year, the expansion's so fast that moving that much material around just requires a ridiculous amount of energy. And longer than 10 mega years, seeing these high energy photons coming from what we presumed to be inverse Compton, although there are other scenarios, uh, that required that the uh, particles have been made in the last several million years. So we thought something like, you know, a few million years was reasonable, and, and we said one to ten to be safe, but a few million is the answer. So um, to cosmological precision, we were right. Um, okay, 
So that's really just an advertisement for that paper that I had nothing to do with, but I'm, I'm very happy to see. Now for the GEV scale excess in the inner galaxy, this is something that I only had a little bit to do with. This all started with a paper by Dan Hooper and Lisa Goodenough five years ago, where they claimed that there were um, excess gammas in the inner galaxy. So now we're ta not talking about the Fermi bubble region, but much closer in, like a degree or two uh, in this paper. And then um, later papers went out a little further and said, actually, this excess seems to extend out to five or 10 degrees. Um, and in recent years, um, my former student, Tracy Slatcher, teamed up with Dan and Tim Linden. They kind of started this paper uh, looking into the signal from the inner galaxy. And then a bunch of us joined on when we decided that maybe they're onto something. So this is an excess that's on top of um, what you would expect from the usual pi zero gammas and Bremschrauen gammas and inverse Compton gammas in the inner galaxy. And, uh, and from the, you know, resolved part sources that we see. So what is it? So Dan Hooper being a dark matter theorist sees things through dark matter lens. Hi Dan, if you're watching. Um, and, uh, so you can imagine for a moment that this signal comes from dark matter annihilation. These are various profiles for the dark matter distribution in the inner galaxy that might be plausible. And so we can make a template out of those. We can make a template for the diffuse emission. Uh, that must be a log stretch. And a template for the Fermi bubbles that's just a cookie cutter. And throw all these things together with a uniform background, you know, the usual game that we've been playing for years, and ask, does the fit want this? And of course, you know, you're sitting there thinking, but, but, but this template isn't good enough to do this. The Fermi diffuse template was made for other purposes. Right, so we're doing things to try to improve that template, but using what was available at the time, our best guess, actually multiple best guesses, um, we, uh, we asked, does the fit want this? And it does, and then you can ask, uh, so if you leave that component out, this is what the residual in the inner galaxy looks like, masking out a degree around the galactic plane. And, you know, there are positive and negative residuals in such a fit, but there are definitely more positive residuals in the galactic center. And uh, so then we can do this in each of many energy bins, and we can plot the flux in that extra component. And it makes kind of a nice uh, looking bump here. And suggestively, this is um, the, the line is a spectrum for some dark matter model that Dan likes. So, um, and yeah, let me not dwell on the details here. There are many ways of looking at this problem. We can fix the spectrum and let the profile slow, uh, you know, let um, spatial morphology float, and then we get something like this, which is, you know, more or less consistent with kind of a power law of uh, radius to the minus 1.4, and then that's that density is squared and projected to get the dark matter signal. So. Um, this is, you know, this is a little too easy, right? If you interpret this as dark matter going to say B quarks, you end up with a number very close to the thermal relic cross-section required for dark matter uh, and a mass of 35 GeV. Um, so it would almost be uh, a shame if the universe chose something so boring to be the dark matter that we could just discover it like that. So that's almost certainly wrong. Uh, why can't it be pulsars is the question everyone asks, especially millisecond pulsars are, you know, something that we've learned a lot about in the last five years, uh, six years from Fermi. And uh, they shine in gamma rays and they have a similar spectrum to this, right? I can glibly say these are dark matter spectra, but if you plot the spectrum of millisecond pulsars, it's not that different. It's significantly different according to the fit, but it's not that different. Here are some examples, in fact. Uh, these are pulsars taken from individual globular clusters or all millisecond pulsars is the dashed line. And you see it goes a bit above the data points over here, whereas dark matter can easily go through the data points. But we have uh, a few different parameters to tune in the dark matter models and the pulsars are what they are. So um, this is not terribly convincing that the dashed line does not go through the data points, right? Um, Okay, so um, 
you know, the, there was a paper already by Hooper et al. before this paper arguing that such a signal is there and can't be pulsars. And what he did was take the distribution of, uh, you know, sources versus flux here for a bunch of things in the Fermi catalog and then try to make corrections for incompleteness and try to draw some lines through that and extrapolate. And what he found was that you need a lot more pulsars than this would indicate. Um, so the, the game here is we can look locally and we can see how many pulsars per stellar mass. And then we can go to the bulge of the galaxy and assume we have the same number of pulsars per stellar mass. Uh, and use the same luminosity function. And so the way Dan likes to put it is, well, the signal could be pulsars if they have a different energy spectrum, a different spatial distribution, and a different overall luminosity function than we think pulsars have. However, um, I don't mean that to be snarky. The bulge is a special place. Um, millisecond pulsars are binary objects, presumably, that may form more readily in the bulge. They've also had more time to do it because the population's old. Maybe we do have eight or ten times as many pulsars per stellar mass in the uh, in inner galaxy. Uh, we just don't know, okay? But I think, actually, Hooper and friends here have discovered something interesting, we just don't know what it is yet. They've either discovered a new population of sources or that the millisecond pulsars don't work quite like we think they do in the inner galaxy, or there's some new diffuse component for which, I mean, if you're going to go that far, then dark matter would be a, a good option, I think, just because it works so, so easily, really wants to work. Okay, so with that set up in my last few minutes, um, there's been this uh, great paper just recently by Samuel Lee et al. Um, again, I'm advertising for my former student. Uh, what they did is they said, rather than just treating every template of emission the same and, and saying, okay, we have this model for the emission, we'll do a Poisson draw from that compared to the data, or equivalently do a, a Poisson likelihood for the data given the model. Uh, if you have a diffuse appearing component, like this, you know, dark matter-ish component that's made of point sources, even if they're unresolved point sources, it changes the distribution of counts in pixels, right? Point sources are very different from it. They're as different as possible from a diffuse emission in terms of the dis distribution of uh, counts in pixels. And so you can use that. So you can do a template fit. They call this a, an NPTF, a non-Poissonian template fit, where some of the templates are truly diffuse and you just do a, a Poisson draw, but then other templates you allow to be made up of little unresolved sources and then you have to draw from a, a different function that's broader than a Poisson. And you can do the delta log likelihood between those two options. So it's a very clever idea. Um, they make a, do a lot of things in the simplest possible way. Uh, so half degree pixels, there's just a single energy bin, 2 to 12 GeV, that's chosen to be kind of centered on this, this mysterious excess. Um, and uh, I think I said all that. They're assuming a broken power law for DNDS for the sources. So they're only fitting whatever that is, five parameters. Um, four parameters, whatever it is. So. Uh, to show that a technique like this isn't utterly insane, we can go to high latitude where we understand the sources fairly well. There are about 1,300 sources in the Fermi catalog above B equals 30. They're mostly AGN, but with a bunch of other things. And uh, so you can do a, a fit of a diffuse model, so the you know, ISM associated emission. The Fermi bubbles, which don't contribute much, but you have to include them in the fit. Uh, an isotropic emission and an isotropic point source emission, and then ask what is the luminosity function of the point sources, or I just, the flux function, right, because um, it's, we don't have distances. And uh, the results they get are promising, okay? So these black points are the sources from the Fermi catalog, so they're kind of truth, at least down to this point. Once you get to here, these are about 15 photons, so when you get down to 10 photons or 3 photons, the sources start to get shaky, especially on top of the background they're on. Okay, so this is incompleteness. But this is probably truth. Okay, and since most of these are AGN, and that's probably a power law going down to much lower fluxes than we observe it, I think it's reasonable to extrapolate this line, 
extrapolate this for another decade. And so if they do a broken power law for maps where they don't mask anything, they get the green line here. So they really zero in on this power law, and it puts the break out here. Okay, if they mask all of the sources in the Fermi catalog, then the broken power law does this. It may look like there's a, a double break. This is actually, these error bars are derived from an ensemble of mini, mini solutions coming out of a Markov chain. And so uh, the 68% confidence region is the colored band. But the point is that this tries to do something consistent with this extrapolation at very low flux. I mean, going down to one photon sources almost. Uh, and then it breaks and falls off as fast as it reasonably can, given that they've masked all of the sources we observe. So this line plus uh, these sources actually gives you something pretty close to the green line. So that's some indication that this is not a crazy technique. Um, so now we'll apply it to the galactic center. So now we have this, um, they call it NFW, but it's this modified, you know, R to the minus 1.4 NFW point source template. Okay, but it's only statistically a point source template. So again, if you don't remove Norn sources, you get the green, goes right through the data points, except there's an implication here that the number of sources keeps increasing a little bit lower in flux. Um, again, this, uh, this cutoff, or I mean, where that power loss seems to level off is about, I think, 15 photons per source. Then if you uh, subtract all of the known sources, you get this other thing, right? It's just falling as fast as it can. But both of these fits are arguing strongly that there's a population of unresolved sources over here. And that's very interesting. Now, uh, you could ask the question, is this better or worse than just having a diffuse component? So here's if you throw both a modified NFW point source component and a modified NFW completely smooth, so dark matter component into the model, let the model take its pick and you see it, it wants entirely the point source component. The, uh, the other gets slammed down to zero as hard as it can be basically. But if you don't include that in the fit, of course, there, there are all the other usual components in the fit here that I'm not, that I'm not plotting that account for 90% of the flux. But uh, the choice between these two is pretty clear. If you only allow the dark matter component, then the fit wants it and gives it almost as much flux because, well, if it can't have the right answer, it'll take the next best thing. That's right on average. And so you can do this without masking any sources, or if you mask, well, then the total amount of emission that's in the inner galaxy is less, but it's still, you know, this blue histogram is entirely separated from the rest of the red histogram. So the um, FIT has given us an answer at high confidence. So is it time to pack up and go home, give up entirely on dark matter? Well, probably, but there's some remaining questions. So why? is there a new point source distribution that rises up from low fluxes just to where it needs to and then cuts off immediately just below the Fermi threshold. That's quite a coincidence. Maybe it is part of the same distribution that we normally see, but even then it has kind of a break in it in just the right spot to have fooled all the previous studies. I mean, it's a little bit of a conspiracy. Um, and uh, also, you know, this analysis is only using one energy bin, but we have information about the energy spectra of the different kinds of point sources. So it seems like it's leaving a lot on the table. It's mixing, for example, it's mis mixing the point spread function of all the different energies that go into that <coughs> bid, and it, the point spread function is very energy dependent, for example. So could we use a different technique and recover the same answer? So in my remaining minute, <laughs> um, I just wanted to mention probabilistic catalogs. So uh, these point source catalogs I'm talking about are the conventional thing of a list of sources and their properties and uncertainties on those properties. But there's been a new idea kicking around the last couple of years of uh, don't do that, just keep an ensemble of catalogs with no error bars, right? It's analogous to keeping Markov chain samples rather than keeping the mean and the variance for the result of your parameter. And uh, it's, it's just a little tricky because when you're searching your parameter space with your Markov chain walkers, it's a trans-dimensional search. You don't know how many point sources you have 
until you're done, and you don't even know then. Your ensemble of catalogs may have different numbers of point sources in. And so um, you need to do this Markov chain stuff very carefully so that you can handle changing the number of dimensions of your parameter space as you search. But that's that's been solved by these folks. And um, so uh, my student, Stefan Portillo, took a stab at this. And uh, this is this is only mock data so far, but this works really well on a mock-up of the Fermi data at high latitude with reasonable point source distributions, luminosity functions, and so on. And so um, I guess I don't want to get into detail about what all these parameters are, but you know, power law index, total number of sources. This is a normalization of the luminosity function, minimum and max fluxes. And um, we should plot little symbols where the true answer is on this, actually. Uh, this was just in an email Stefan sent the other day, not meant for public consumption. But the true answers for all these quantities are right in the middle of the clouds of the points, which is all you can really ever ask for from a Markov chain. And, and in fact, any of these um, degeneracies you see make perfect sense, right? There's a degeneracy between the number of sources and where you put the minimum flux cut. Uh, but all of these give about the same number of total photons in the image, and they're all consistent with the data. So this is an interesting way to think about catalogs, you know, whether it's um, really hugely enabling and transformative for this specific problem. I like this idea in general, that you can have an ensemble of catalogs, all of the strange little covariances that you'd like to keep track of, uh, or all the error propagation problems that you often have working with catalogs. Those things can be made much simpler by thinking about catalogs this way. And computers are so powerful nowadays, it's not a burden to keep a 1,000 realizations of your catalog. So um, I was just kind of throwing that, that out there as a cool idea that may or may not relate to helping us solve this problem. By the way, um, so in Stefan's realizations of the catalog there, he gets this Brazil plot, and the truth that was put into the catalog is the points. And you see. We're great at nine photons, and even at a few photons, the, uh, the answer is logarithmically centered on the truth. So this does seem to work. Um, OK, so I presented this curious signal in the inner galaxy, which I really do think is there. Um, there were some reasons to think that it might be dark matter. It can be explained by a very simple model, relic cross-sections, just what you expect. Improvements in the analysis over the years that we did that I, I didn't tell you about made the answer better, not worse. I mean, made it more like dark matter and less like pulsars. So we took those as encouraging signs. On the other hand, the inner galaxy is truly a confusing place, and there are lots of things going on we don't understand. And we really don't know much about millisecond pulsars in the inner galaxy. Um, and we're leaning pretty hard on a diffuse model that was not made for this. And now this very recent paper of Lee et al. says it's all wrong. So those are some very good reasons <laughs> to doubt <laughs> that dark matter has been discovered in the inner galaxy. But I think something interesting is going on, and we should pursue it. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Question, please. Can you elaborate about the, uh, the point source model? You're saying it is non-Poissonian. But is that meaning that spatially when you build the model, uh, it doesn't follow smooth Poissonian distribution? I mean, the point source will follow Poissonian by itself uh, within a source, right? Yeah, so it just means um, if you, so if you just had you know uniform background and do your Poisson draw that, on that and plot the histogram of the counts and pixels, you get a Poisson distribution. If there are point sources present, you get something broader, right? Because the tail gets long because you have a few pixels that have a lot of counts. So you get a broader histogram. Oh, okay. And so what they're doing is, as a function of four or five parameters that describe a broken power law, uh, they can determine what that histogram should look like. And then they're basically fitting the histogram. I mean, they're doing a proper likelihood yeah. analysis, it, given that. But. Wouldn't that mean the, uh, the uh, point source model would have a lot more freedom compared to just a uh, pure Poissonian model? As a result, when you fit them together, it is reasonable to that to take over the residual. As a result, when you have uh, two models together, then the, the point source model always kind of tends to win. I mean, it's true that because it has more free parameters, it will always fit better. But they claim to have correctly penalized the fit for the additional freedom. And the fit still really wants 
that. And in fact, you can in the supplemental material in their paper, you can see uh, a, hist a, a Poisson distribution and the histogram of the actual points, and they're just by eye. They're clearly different. So that is pretty convincing, actually, when you just look at it. They, they've done, I mean, this is a very long paper, actually. They've done a lot of tests, and uh, I, I find them fairly convincing. Doug, a quick, quick question. If the emission of this gamma ray emission is, in fact, millisecond pulsars, how many pulsars are there? Some number, like 3,000. Uh, you know, depending on exactly where you put the cut, that, that can flop around a lot. That order. Yeah. Is there any chance that these could be found in another band, in the radio, or the X-ray, or something? So that would be lovely to, you know, really drill in with radio or something and try to try to find them. Um, we haven't done anything about that yet, but um, we're happy to talk. Could SKA do that? Could SKA do? I'll bet SKA could do that. That's a great way to. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> We should talk. So I had a <clears throat> corollary of that question. Suppose you started discovering in, uh, high frequency surveys by SK or GBT. Even. How would uh, millisecond pulsars in the radio um, would um, constraining the numbers affect you, or it's mu much more insidious than that? Yeah, I mean it's really the overall luminosity function <coughs> because if. The luminosity function is tilted such that most of the flux comes from the faint ones, which is sometimes the case. Um, then just counting the bright ones doesn't necessarily solve the overall problem. We really we need to know if the luminosity distribution cuts off where it does locally, um, and of course there's some uncertainty in that too. Uh, and we really need to know what the function looks like near that cutoff. Doesn't mean we can't do it, right? Just you know, better data can can solve this problem. But last question: Distances in the galaxy are hard, as you know. Yes. Um, so there are stars that one could use for UV absorption targets towards the Fermi bubbles, and you might be able to get an upper limit on the distance that's less than eight kiloparsecs, which would be really fascinating. It could be two, for example. Yeah. Um, that's right. If, if by some conspiracy, this structure that's centered at about L equals zero is actually close to us. The, the Skosin association is about a kiloparsec in that direction. And, and it's also at L equals zero. Right. Yeah. So coincidences happen, and that's good to keep in mind. Yeah. Good point. Okay. Thank you very much, Doug. Lots of coincidences happen. <laughs>